Warning, the Not Real Art Podcast is intended for creative audiences only. The Not Real Art Podcast celebrates creativity and creative culture worldwide. It contains material that is fresh, fun and inspiring and is not suitable for boring old art snobs. Now, let's get started and enjoy the show. Greetings and salutations, my creative brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast, where we celebrate creative culture and the artists who make it. I'm your host, Erin Yoshi, and today we have the esteemed Brett Cook. Brett Cook is an interdisciplinary artist and educator who uses storytelling to distill complex ideas and creative practices to transform outer and inner worlds of being. He's taught at all academic levels in a variety of subjects and published in academic journals, including the Maryland Institute College of the Arts and Harvard University. In 2016, he illustrated Clouds in a Teacup with Thich Nhat Hanh, the legendary Buddhist monk and peace activist. In 2017, he was the Director of Social Practice and Pedagogy at San Francisco State University Health and Equity Institute and a Visiting Professor at the Community Arts Social Practice and Diversity Studies at the California College for the Arts. Today, he's working on institutional transformation with Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Brett is a powerful creator and a thought leader. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. So I'm so excited today because we have not only the Oracle himself, okay, Brett Cook. Brett Cook to me has been a mentor for many, many years. And I feel like I've seen you in your own trajectory over the last couple of decades. And I'm so, so thankful to have you here on Not Real Art. So welcome, Brett Cook. So great to be here. So excited to be here. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure and honor. Well, you know, I've been looking forward to this conversation. You've always been one of the people that I've had in my mind. You know, I love to interview you. I love talking to you any chance I get. So because I've known you for a while, I want you to take our audience back. Share a little bit about your early journey. Like, where did you grow up? What got you into the arts? So I grew up in San Diego, California. My parents were educators. And I can remember my mother giving me check deposit slips in church when I was two or three to keep me quiet. I would draw on them. So I've always been a drawing person my whole life, but I don't come from an artistic family per se. But as a person who grew up in, you know, Black American culture, I liked music and drawing. And so what has become hip hop was originally just Black culture. So you know, back then, it's like, if you could draw, you did graffiti and you wrote rhymes and I was popping and locking and all of that. <laughs> but what was different about that time is that when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, really the 80s, there wasn't the same global saturation of what hip hop is and certainly not graffiti or public art. So part of my kind of foundation artistically was really a popular kind of construct that I think in terms of the most superficial construction of the way Americans think about art, you know, and that was probably accented by Chicano Park and Chicano gang murals or tags that really that were part of my kind of visual experience grew up in San Diego. And so I just said, I like to draw. I'm just going to start painting on walls. So there was no crew, you know, there were no people that I knew of. I just started writing, just doing characters in San Diego in the middle of the night, you know, getting cans from Kmart. And then eventually started to see there were some people in San Diego who started writing, but I didn't really know them. And then there was a guy, Fizz, who I later met, who had actually moved to San Diego to go to the Navy from New York. And he started doing throw-ups And when I was a junior in high school. And I saw these big Fizz throw-ups. And I was like, that's graffiti. Like, he's doing what I'm doing. Like, I need to find him. But I never found him. And then when I moved to, I actually moved to Berkeley to study zoology. Really? I didn't know that. Really? Oh, yeah. So Berkeley was number one in the nation for zoology. I was a child prodigy as a kid. So while I was drawing, I was also this kind of science prodigy. 
And I went to Berkeley because they were number of the nation in zoology and they had basketball and lacrosse. And I want to play basketball and lacrosse. And so that's how I made it to Berkeley. I didn't know it's social justice history per se. I mean, I had spent a lot of time. My father was from the Bay Area, so I knew it. But I didn't know its kind of social significance as an institution very much. And conveniently, when I moved there, you know, I brought the passion that I had in San Diego of just putting stuff on walls. But it was at the beginning of the Golden Age of Graffiti in the Bay. So as I started writing there as a freshman in college, you know, all of the people that are thought of as the OGs of Berkeley were literally just starting to write, too. And so we were painting and like, I remember being in college doing pieces in the junior high school just because that's where everyone wrote at Washington Junior High or whatever, you know, like those were these kind of locusts. And even some of the people weren't in college, they were in high school or the few of us like Barry McGee or whatever that were in college, we were still so young. But it was at a time that that was emerging. And so the more conventional aspects of like tagging and crews and, you know, became really personal and... I'm at Berkeley. So I'm studying art history and African-American history and sociology and philosophy and all these other things that were also starting to really modify, which was already in a kind of an original creation myth for my relationship mm-hmm. to art. And do you mind sharing? I, and you don't have to if you can't, but what did you used to write? I used to write Disney. Well, first I started writing Mouse. Like when I was in San Diego, I wrote Mouse because I had forever written these characters that were mice and they'd have fat shoestrings and they'd be throwing parties where there's these like characters that were my childhood, became my nickname. So all through junior high, high school, even college, all the people who knew me in athletics knew me as Mouse. So Disney was like, oh, well, I'll do this like crazy, you know, I'll change the Z and it'll be like not Walt Disney, it'll be my own Disney. So, you know, it's like my adolescent effort to be original and creative, which wasn't original creative at all, but that's what I was trying to do. And that's really where Disney is what I started writing in the Bay and then carried that for a long time when I eventually moved to New York, but we can get to that when we do. Right. Like I first met you as Disney. I didn't know about Mouse, but it's just funny because you're tall. So I always think of mice as little and that's, I like that. That's really funny. I might pull that one out one night. Pull it out. Yeah. No shame in my game. My political career has long since been not an option. So. so you were in Berkeley. Did you graduate from Berkeley? And then what took you from the Bay Area over to New York? So, you know, I went to school to study zoology. It's intense. Berkeley's intense. So yeah. I'd study, but- I was painting on walls in the middle of the night. I was going to nightclubs. Like I'm playing sport. Like there are all these other things that made me not do well in school. And my parents are like, look, man, you're on AP. You know, we've always loved you and said you could. Well, what are you going to do? First of all, you're messing up. What are you going to do? Looks like this is not working. And I said, maybe I can do art. You know, my parents said, look, Brett, we've always loved you and supported you and said you could grow up and be whatever you want to be. But you can't be no artist, man. That don't make no sense. Like, nobody's an artist. Like, that's not a job. So they really encouraged me to study education as educators and as someone who was always good in education. So I started my summer jobs were teaching. I'd come back from the Berkeley in the summer, first couple of years, and I'd teach. And so I eventually got two degrees. And that was another thing that eventually informed, I think, my trajectory is that you know, I was studying social and anthro and all these other kind of socially considerate disciplines, not just craft and art history. So I think that that informed practically my life and that I was always teaching as a way to kind of support my art practice. And then eventually I just said, I came to the realization as a kind of emergent, ambitious young artist in the Bay that artists are as dynamic as their experiences. And I always joke that, you know, at the time, I was like most Californians that I knew. I had only gone where Southwest flew. And back then, Southwest (laughs) flew to like Vegas, maybe Seattle, but I had maybe been to DC. Yeah, exactly. Back then, it was all West Coast. So, like, I had never even seen that much of the country, much less world. And I knew that on some level, to be a dynamic maker, I needed to have a more dynamic life. So, with $700, never being really to the East, East Coast before. I moved. I knew two people there. I house sat for one for a month. And really, it wasn't because it was the center of the art world. That was a convenient, serendipitous 
outcome. It was really just like so many of the people that I was really kind of stimulated by and so many of the cultural things that I was interested in in terms of like house music or dance hall or just things that I liked, like they were around New York and stuff was around New York. And so my first studio was actually in Jersey and I lived in Jersey for two and a half years in Newark. And I was thinking, well, when I was in the Bay, I lived in Oakland. I just went to San Francisco all the time. I'll just live in Newark and go to New York all the time, which is what I did. But when I got there, like no one else did that. (laughs) And people in Newark were like, I've never been in Manhattan or I've been there one time my whole life. (laughs) And I was literally going there like every day, all the time. For the first six months, I wasn't even working. I was just absorbing. And then I eventually started an array of teaching kind of mutated gigs in New York that kept me there on the daily. And then eventually I received a fellowship at the same time that I got a project and I spent all of it to move to New York. And then wow. New York, and then there's a whole other chapter yeah. for that. Yeah, so the New York days. So I used to hear about this legendary space that you had, right? It was like the studio that was massive, that the parties were amazing. Like how do you go from couch surfing or house sitting at your friend's house to this massive art space. In Newark, I've found this place. Newark is one of those cities. It's part of that industrial belt that by the time I got there, it already collapsed. So there were literally blocks of these giant factories that were empty. And there's a whole array of, Willie Cole is probably the most famous, but there are a bunch of relatively successful artists whose practice came out of taking stuff from those abandoned places. And so I lived in the same building with Willie And two other artists, Kevin Sampson. But I mean, it was like a six floor block. We would never see each other. So I had thousands of square feet. And we could walk into the empty spaces and it's abandoned. So after two years, they literally abandoned it. People were breaking in while I'm living there. I spent a winter with no heat there. Broke. People stealing the copper. And I got one gig and used cash that in to move to New York. And it was the same time that I got a Studio Museum of Harlem residency. So I had... Basically built up a very successful career in the Bay before I moved. I was this young lion. I was showing extensively. I was curating. I was in all these different tiers of the pond. And then I basically started over as a nobody. And it took a couple of years, but a lot of that literacy, then I just kind of turned over directly and indirectly and eventually rebuilt myself. And even at the time that I moved, so I got this gig and found this place in Harlem. I had curators or people I was working with, they're like, don't move to Harlem. Curators aren't going to come see you there. No one wants to go to Harlem. And I was like, you know, I'm not actually moving to Harlem for the art world. I'm moving there for me. Like I move it because that's a dynamic place and an interesting place. And I found a 5,000 square foot space that was raw. And I had a friend from California who lived in New York now who was an architect. And so, you know what they say about, or at least this is what I say now, things cost twice as much and they take twice as long. So what I imagined was going to be this space I developed and I had a cushion to live in ended up be this thing that the day it got done, I was broke, but I had freaked out this amazing place. And so for eight and a half years, I basically hustled to sustain an apartment and this 5,000 square foot space in Harlem that was more than a mortgage on most houses. But at the same time became this, in addition to my personality and interests, became this place where I had events and hosted showings and just threw parties. And it was concurrent to other people of that time in New York being so vibrant and creative and then Harlem starting to change. So when Thelma Gold did a new kind of Leadership came to the Studio Museum was at the same time that Julie Mertu and Sanford Biggers and all these people were moving to Harlem, but it still hadn't been found. And so all the talk of the New Harlem really came to me, you know. So when CBS or the New York Times want to talk about the New Harlem, like I was one of those voices. And so that was part of what sustained the practice, but it wasn't lucrative. You know, it was always someone told me early on, like, that's why they call it fame and fortune. Like they're not. They don't happen necessarily at the same time. Like you could be super famous and broke, (laughs) which I was. I was straight broke all the time to pay my rent behind every month. But at the same time, like super prolific and doing projects all over, really eventually all five boroughs. And another part of that, which is really in hindsight convenient was, you know, there's such a rich graffiti history to New York. So for me to come there 
so committed to that material, but in such a unique, original way. Like there was the ability to be literate about it and still recognize like this is a whole other. He's not doing what we've been doing here forever. He's not doing this. He's freaked out some new thing that could be appreciated in a different way, I think, than in other cities. Whether they're still like for what used to happen, even during the golden age in the Bay, it was still really iterative. You know, it was still like there's a famous clip of Dream talking about subway art being like, yeah, man, I was biting all over subway art just because that's how you start. That's what we did, you know, and there was still a part of that that when I was in the Bay in some ways was a friction because I got really clear even in the Bay. Like I wasn't trying to be a graffiti artist per se. Like that was not the end goal for me that I got cred as a writer. I recognized that was part of the practice and it was part of my value, but like that wasn't my end goal. I was much more interested in being something more creative and socially considerate, I think, than Graph has been. Could you tell us like what was your work like at that time? Because as we look at like the span of you as your artistic practice, what type of art were you making then? In the Bay, you know, it's so interesting the way I teach about it a lot. So much of like social commentary, I think, is taught as critique, whether it's social or institutional. You know, so a lot of my early work was about here's something that's messed up. Let me tell you about it. Like here's something that's messed up. Let me tell you about it. And I'm going to put it in a setting outside of the gallery so you can access it, you know, because part of the significance of having families who were educators, like they didn't look at art. No, they weren't looking at art. They're all teachers. My dad's assistant superintendent of schools in San Diego. So like we're middle class and educated and they're not looking at art and all their friends are teachers and principals and they're not looking at art either. So, you know, I was part of my interest in putting it outside beyond the ego of I wanted it to be seen by my friend and peer group as I was trying to put it where places where people would see it. And with the idealism that this would transform the way they saw the world and make them different. And then kind of through that trajectory, I started to recognize more as I got to New York, like, you know, actually telling people that stuff's messed up, like a lot of people already know it's messed up. Like they don't need me to tell them. And that's not actually changing that it's messed up. That's just giving that more energy. And so if I really want to transform things, representation's not enough. Like there needs to be some other piece. And I think that's where what is serendipitous is I eventually, after teaching in a few different gigs, I fell into this. This is salient. One of the two people I knew when I moved to New York was Annie Philbin. And I don't know if you know who Annie Philbin is, but Annie Philbin, she's the head of the hammer. So at the time, she was the director of the Drawing Center. And the Drawing Center was a powerful nonprofit. And so I met her. I was on the curatorial board of Southern Exposure. And we had her come out to juror a show. And we hit it off. And she said, well, if you ever come to New York, like you can house sit for me for a month. And so eventually they had a consortium of nonprofits that were running an ed program in the Lower East Side. And they knew I had been teaching at Berkeley High. After college, I ended up teaching for a year at Berkeley High. And so they said, look, we're doing this project. We are going to work with this blue chip collector and it's got to be integrated in the school's curriculum. So we want to know if you can do it for us because we need someone to do this better than the people that are doing it. And I said, well, if it's like not full time, you pay me a bunch of money and it's not at the art spaces, it's at the school, I'll do it. And so it ended up really being powerful, not only because it was a super powerful project and it got me really literate with all these powerful art world entities and individuals. It really began my kind of exposure and understanding of really progressive pedagogy that I'd already taught in schools a bunch. My parents were teachers. And one of the things about teaching, like most things, is like you teach the way you've been taught. And so it was really powerful to be in this really radical, progressive school that was an alternative high school. So last stop for kids before their GEDs, you know, many of the kids in group homes, all the kids on free lunch, 99% kids of color, really different program, different structures, and to actually learn a new way of teaching that involved peer-generated assessment and portfolio reviews versus grades, like all these things that were so different in the classroom that I started thinking about, well, what if I did that in the like work that I do? What if I started having the people that I'm working with in the streets developing the curriculum or developing the questions or leading the inquiry? And so that then started happening where I was like, oh, yeah, this isn't just about talking about stuff that's messed up. We're actually now getting to a place where we can have people lead the inquiry about what they want to talk about as a part of their path to transformation. 
And at the same time, we'll still make something that looks dope. So like you can get hooked on the image or you can have that object that lives over a longer period of time. But the relational part of that transformation really became more significant. So that then I started doing these portraits with people talking about the issues of the places and sites. And then it could be about anything. It could be about history. It could be about social issues. It could be about things that were timely. Part of the attraction of doing things publicly is like it could be timely. You could stay up all night or just go burn a piece. And it's like, this is what's happening right now. So to bring that with another level of participant involvement and then another kind of rigor of the craft was just a really perfect storm in New York. Yeah, absolutely. And so that was happening in the space. So all of this was happening (laughs) in this 5,000 square foot space. So on the one hand, you had interns or people were interested or writers that were coming, but then, you know, I'm starting to navigate the art world. So you're having museum directors or curators. And, but at the same time, like I said, Sanford and Julie and all these people are like, those are my neighbors. Those are the people that are hanging out with me, you know, that are coming to these parties, the Greg Tates and the Nari Ward, like all of these giants of creative practice were at that time in different stages of their careers and not just visual art. Like there are musicians and either all of these different creative dancers, like all of these different young creatives kind of connected through these things that I was doing at my space. Yeah, absolutely. I wish that I could have been a fly on the wall or really just in the mix there because it always sounds amazing. These well, it's deep because now I can still go back to New York. And I still have cred, like just from those parties, like whether people there or not, like people like, oh man, or even more, I think people lament that that's gone. New York is one of those places that's never, it's not like California, you're like, let's go over our friend's house and hang out. Or like New York, people meet at bars or they meet it out, or there's a radical party culture there in terms of like clubs and some house parties, but it's different. And so I had this place that like, Really regularly, people would be like, oh, Brett's having another thing in the studio. We got to go. And so it was this thing that became a way that not just me, but I brought up Sanford tonight for some reason. But like Rich Medina is a close friend. And like tonight on his Twitch stream, he's going to talk to Sanford about his new installation at the Kennedy Center. But it's in the like press that like they met at Brett's house. Like they met through (laughs) Brett. Like I'm having Sanford on. I met him with Brett. So it was like not just about me. It was like that became a place for all these other kind of social networks to be constructed. That gave it its value. Right, as well it's as a the community brownies. gathering space, which is amazing. Yeah, and the brownies, of course. <laughs> Everybody's going to come for that. You kind of touched a little bit on your community process, and I feel like nobody does it like you do. I've been a little bit participatory in some of your ways, and I see where you know everybody on the block, You know, everybody knows your name, they know your face. It's not just you show up, you do your art, and you're out. And I feel like that's so common today where people say that they have a community process, but it's really just, they're just kind of in and out, quick workshop and out. And you don't do that. You really get to know people and build and take your time to do it. Can you walk us a little bit through your community process? Yeah. I mean, I I would say that I think it's evolved. I think, as you suggested, part of that was initially catalyzed by my role as an educator. And I was thinking of the ways that like a peer review process in a classroom setting, you'd have people come up with questions and then they review it together. And so I started using that initially with groups of people that I was doing projects with. And I started to recognize that in a lot of ways, there's really powerful transformation in those relationships that are not evident in the object, but are part of the art that I wanted to make. So it became about then a much more a conceptual art. You know, it's really conceptualizing these new methodologies to have people be in relation and transform. So it started as this thing like, yeah, we're going to have you come up with questions. I'm going to interview you with the questions in your neighborhood and then mount you with transcriptions from your interview in the work so that everyone can see it or literally the whole transcribed interview of our hour and hour and a half talk or videos or audio so that it really became a magnification of their voice. Because if you think about the history of Western art, the model almost never has a voice. So you see Gauguin paint those naked ladies or you see Andre Serrano take a picture of a Klansman or whatever, whatever it is, you're still seeing that mitigated through the filter of the artists. And so you know, part of the radicality of my work early was I'm actually just going to use this as a vehicle to magnify your voice. 
you already have one, but what does it mean to magnify it specifically to the place where you're going to be installed? But then from there, like I said, I started to recognize all these other ways to have more people engaged in that process. So what does it mean in versus like a traditional mural dedication? What if that's like another celebration or what if that's some other kind of event? Or what if all of this is a part of collecting data for some other thing that we want to address that's a need for this community? Or what if all of this is another way of doing assessment for something around preterm birth, whatever the condition may be, you know? So I think for me, it's become a whole nother part of my practice that in many ways, the art is just making that learning visible that whatever the products are being made are increasingly just documenting elements of that transformation that are happening in the relationship. You know, and I think for me, that's the part I think that's, at least I'm more interested in now, you know, that I think earlier I had this idealistic notion that representation in public space would really cause radical social change. And there are many paths and in some ways it has, and it's a superficial illustration of much more sophisticated challenges and conditions. And so maybe because of my background in teaching, I just want to be more hands-on in that. Like I see the ability to have a different kind of change by really being in relation to people and having people be in relation to each other. And so, you know, even within my process where initially it's like, oh, I'm going to work with 10 people that I like and we share the same values and we'll make this thing together. It's expanded to be like, well, how do I really intentionally get a bunch of people who are not the same? How does this become the mechanism for them to then see each other in ways that they didn't before, you know, or find new ways to address conflict or challenges under this making things together or making art objects as the vehicle to do that in? I love what you just said, because I feel like it's so often where people will say, about art, that art is transformative in itself. And I really agree with you that it's sometimes it's the process around the art that is its own art form that really is a transformative space. And I really love that idea of that the art piece is just making it visible. You know, I think that that's really, really a profound statement because sometimes it feels over inflated when people say that, like, oh, the art itself is so transformative. And it's like, well, I mean, it is. That's one portion of it. But really those relationships and that setting and the experience is what often I see is transforming people. So I I love that. I think it's analogous to our society. I think as a child of the civil rights era, Sesame Street was so important to me. The fact that there were these multi-ethnic, multi-colored people in power and learning, you know, really helped forge who I am as a person. And- Clarence Thomas is on the Supreme Court. Like he's not championing any of the values of black people in America. (laughs) And in terms of most values, he's not championing, but he looks like a black person. Yeah. And it's such a epitome of representation is not enough just because you look a certain way for me. And I think that's even more part of my privilege of the career that I had as an art, capital A artist in New York, you know, that I really got to see that the emperor wears no clothes, that oftentimes these gestures of we're highlighting transformation or we're championing social justice, you know, are not. Mm -hmm. They're more convenient approaches to reconcile people's guilt or interest to address something, but not in a big committed way. I mean, one of the famous stories, I think I might have told you this, but there was a great painter that I was inspired by in college named Sue Ko. She was big in the 80s. She did these really intense black and white paintings with Reagan and Nazis and different political people from that era portrayed as these kind of Gestapo-like villains. And they're really intense. And she was successful briefly and did a lot of illustration stuff. And I can remember talking to a gallerist that represented her. And her saying to the gallerist, like, look, I want to know who you're selling the paintings to. And the gallerist was like, yo, man, we can't tell you who we're selling the paintings to. Not only just because we don't want to let you know who we're selling the paintings to, because that's where we get our money from. But we don't want to tell you because basically the people who are buying your paintings are the people you're painting. You know, and so it really (laughs) got into, for me, the emperor wears no clothes, like getting behind the scenes that like when you get into commercial art, who are the people that have the liquid assets to make these kind of investments? And just because I'm painting some socially progressive image, 
there's some radically conservative person who's going to take this object and put it in a building and not show it until they can sell it for more money. They're not being driven by its social agenda or potential to transform the world to make it more equitable. They're being driven by its financial value and how it can be turned over to improve their investment. And that might look like a black photograph or a queer installation or whatever, but it's not the fundamental reason of why they're purchasing this work. And even if it is, it's still such an elite select few of us who've gotten to be living that myth, you know, that continues to have people going to art school thinking that they're going to grow up and have a gallery and just paint all the time, you know, and it's just like, that's such a mythology that is not true. So for me, having that experience really close up for, I think, other people in the same trajectory of me, they follow that and now they have things at the Kennedy Center. I'm still somehow committed to the grassroots, those people that I was writing with in the streets in Berkeley and Oakland and before, and really trying to still make work that somehow doesn't sacrifice my sense of equity in the world. Yeah, I definitely think you've created your own stream because I feel like a lot of people that do work that is cultural or socially conscious sometimes get boxed out of the fine art contemporary art world, where a lot of times I feel like you've actually been able to navigate your own way, kind of like in between and back and forth, where you do have these major sponsors or major partnerships that could be public or through foundations, but then at the same time also be like in a fine art gallery. And, you know, I really haven't seen many people being able to do that before. How do you feel like you've kind of made that navigation? Well, I think to be really honest, and I think this might be informative, you know, I think it took a long time to wrestle with my own complexes. Like, I think what's really deep to think about is the way that I resented the white Christian capitalist patriarchy of that I was being taught about in college. And yet I still thought that real art that was the most important was the stuff in a museum. Or even when you think about writers, like all the time, writers will be like, that's a artist, man. I don't like artists. I don't like street artists. And like, how can I sell my art? How can you put it in a gallery and have it really be valuable? That was a good thing about growing up as an artistic person in the Bay, that there was silk screening. There was the Chicano print movement. There were murals. There was art institutions. Like it was a little less balkanized. You know, when I went to New York, even the old school writers were like, I'm trying to have a show in Chelsea. They were like all trying to be in this kind of supremacy that as I started to navigate through it, I started to see these things that like, that's not what makes it valuable just because it's in those interior spaces or just because it is collected. That's not necessarily all of its value. And so that became then part of my work. And I think I've really been intentional about trying to make those boundaries semi-permeable. And so part of that means The craft part, I mean, the part that I think the interior spaces really champion that is that they want things that are formally really complex, beautiful, masterful, for lack of a better word, you know, and even that's challenging. Even that's been something I've unpacked because it's still about this Western kind of notion of like the individual artist is the master and they make these great things that then because that person somehow separate and different than everyone else, we should think of them as great. And I, for a long time, as another kind of stream in my practice, like what's it mean to have other people make the thing? You know, what's it mean to have other people, not just their voice, but they're coloring it or they're drawing it or they're helping to perform it, install it. And so then it's like, how do you do that in a way that is still formally compelling. You know, I had a an artist in college tell me once, doesn't matter how good the idea is, if it's a bad painting, it's a bad painting. You know, so there's a part of that like <laughs> that's kind of true. Like that's it's, it's kind of it can't be booty if you want it to be taken seriously and just because it's something painted masterful, if it's exploitive and not done in right livelihood, like for me that doesn't make it great art. I would say that's really become the crux of my career. And continues to be and trying to think about the ways to flatten those hierarchies and those complexes that we have in ourselves, that we think about what art should be, who should be in it, what makes it valuable, what gives it purpose, and literally, you know, transcend those limitations for my own understanding of equity and to model that belief so that other people can also expand beyond these mythologies of what we think it means to be an artist. 
Right. Well, I also think because you use so many different mediums and because like you do have this level of mastery. I don't want to say perfection, but it's polished. You're not putting out something that's looking like you just did it yesterday. You know what I mean? Like your stuff is polished. You put in that time, but also you navigate so many different mediums. And I feel like every time I've kind of jumped in at different stages, it's like, oh, you were doing the wood pieces with the block print on top with the portrait. Then it moves to these altars around them. And there's just I mean, the altars, they blew me away because I got to work a little bit with you on one of these shows. How did you start doing these altar pieces around your pieces? And you still carry this in some of your practices today. What is the intention with this? It's kind of twofold. I realized, like I said, I was drawing when I was two, three. And besides sharks and cars that drove fast, like I was drawing myself. And I can remember realizing when I moved to New York, like seeing other artists and looking at their figurative drawings, even their sketching and being able to see them in the sketch, just see their literal silhouette in the way that they drew someone else, you know? So I think that practice of drawing myself had always been a thing, but it was actually in Newark when I'm doing all these like social commentary paintings and I'm busy, like I'm showing and getting out there and hustling and people are taking interest in my work and there was a woman I knew who's in our world and she's like, yeah, this is all great, but like, this ain't you. Like, where are you? What's the part about, yeah, you're talking about Rwanda or Haiti or whatever, but like, where are you in this? You know, and I think it's again, that kind of tension, like so much of Western art really hinges on that self-absorbed mastery piece. And so a part of me getting to the self-portrait, that was a part of getting to those altars was like, yeah, so much of Western gallery practice is about the individual. It just is. Richard Serra has a show. You don't even know what's going to be in there. You're going to see the show because Richard Serra is having a show. It's like so self-absorbed that way. And for me, part of the wrinkle was I was aspiring to make these really personal projects so that when people looked at it, they also saw themselves. The objects or the narratives or the stories became this way that I was actually trying to find ways to have the audience be more engaged in the representation. A lot of times the representation I felt was so distant that if it was about a sociological analysis or intervention, it just was so culturally removed from the viewer, they wouldn't be able to get it. So doing things personal, like people would say, I had that toy. I remember. Th-. And so it eventually inevitably really made them reflect on themselves in relation to issues of masculinity or race or whatever it was that was part of the portrait. And I think in the light of this conversation, it's been one of the more tougher semi-permeable boundaries, I think, to break, you know, in the sense that those first pieces were pretty critically acclaimed, but not widely collected. The things that where I was collected were other things I was making, drawings, other pieces. And so they got a lot of critical acclaim and then they've just never been sold. And they've really, you know, now for... We're getting that more than 25 years. Like I have a bunch of self-portraits going right now. You know, I get that's never stopped in my practice because I think another part of them for me came to realize like just a way they helped me really understand myself. They weren't angsty. It's not about trauma per se, but I have had the benefit, which not all of us as humans do, of having a really decades to think deeply about my relationship to people into the world and you do through these self-portraits that consequently I think have impacted the way that I relate in the community work that I do, how I identify as a person, how I feel my comfort as a person. And so that they conceptually have helped me in the community work that I do. And then to go back to the other point, they were aspiring to operate in that really highest level of formal expectation in a way that if you have kids working on a mural who never study painting, it's not about making a modernist thing. That's not what you're trying to make for their school or even whoever it is. You know, so many muralists, they're not necessarily all classically trained. So it's like that for me, I was always trying to like carry all of that. So there weren't these, I think the positive way to spin it is so that it can operate in all of these different values. You know, I think the more negative analysis would be, I didn't want to make it easy for people to marginalize. Like, oh, this is the street art. This is graffiti. Whereas like a graffiti artist, like that's dope. But for someone in the art world, like a 16 by 16 foot painting in the gallery is a painting. A 16 by 16 foot painting outside is a mural. Like it's not art in the same way. Yeah. It doesn't go in white box. Yeah. And part of what I knew 
early on is when people were giving me a hard time in college because I was spray painting. I knew that was related to race and class. I knew that this was, whether intentional or unintentional, it was about these hierarchies and these complexes that were part of what I was really being inculcated by, really learning and studying in college. And so I think part of addressing white supremacy for me has been like that dismantling, you know, that flattening, that demystification of this, like some individual that has their privilege in it just because of their mastery, they get to do whatever they want. To me, that's not appropriate. So I don't want to emulate that just so that I can be successful. Right. (laughs) Because then you're, in other ways, it's like you're not successful because you're not being true to yourself. Yeah. Well, and I think it's taken a couple episodes. It's taken a lifetime of challenges to really, what do they say? Steel forges steel, you know, like really be pushed to like, to what degree am I going to stay committed to that as a belief? And I think for me, it's what I was trying to say about the self-portraits. It came to recognizing not the external value that made it important, but really what it was doing to me as an individual. That's another deep tension, whether it's a graph writer or a street artist or a commercial artist. Like early on, so much of my value was going to be based on how was that thing received? You know, did it not get buffed? You know, did it get a review? I had this huge show and was someone going to write about it? Are people going to come? And I think I had to, through my practice, realize like there are all these things in the practice that are transformative for me as an individual that make it valuable. That's really such a, an important part of why I've chose to be an artist. And it's nice to have these other external impacts. But ultimately, I've just become more trustworthy in what it's done for me as a parent and a partner and as a person. I want to touch on this series that you've done, and I feel like it's kind of transcended in multiple works of yours, but when you started doing work around healing, could you tell us a little bit about that series, your healing series, and also just even the illustrations that you did with Thich Nhat Hanh? Well, it's related to this conversation. I think part of that analysis of like, here's something that's messed up, let me tell you about it, presupposes a right and a wrong that's really clear. And I think a lot of times the injustice or oppression that is manifest in our world is really a manifestation of those people's suffering. That that's not a whole person. You know, Donald Trump's not a whole person. Why would we expect him to do things that are whole and wholesome and kind? Like he's a sick person. And so for me, when I started thinking about, again, social transformation, it's like, even if we have all these information, even if we study it, like if we're not whole people, we're not going to do wholesome things, you know? And so it really, you know, when I think about healing, there's a great quote by uh, Andrew Wheel. He's like a contemporary alternative medicine guru. And, you know, he talks about treatment comes from outside, healing comes from within. The word healing, it comes from like making whole. And so, so oftentimes when we can think about whatever the injustice or oppression might be, there are people in there who are not whole. Whether it's the police officer who's shooting the person or the person who's being victimized or what, like there are all these conditions where people are not whole. And so how do we then address those? If we're really trying to create a more whole, just world, then it's really at those personal relationships and those individuals that we need that wholeness to be kind of cultivated. And so that's why for me, really being kind of overt about that as an agenda work conceptually. And then I think like a lot of these things we're talking about. You know, they're based in personal experience. After years of getting into meditation and getting into yoga and studying herbal medicine and like really it was through those other modalities that I started to get the language and understanding to approach this in art. Because artistically, galleries weren't trying to be whole. They're trying to be paid or writers aren't necessarily trying to make wholeness. They're trying to be seen or do stuff that's dope or whatever. You know, it's not driven by that larger agenda, which I've become increasingly interested in. It's like, how do we reconcile that we are all surrounded by trauma in people, all of us? And so for me, I had self-portraits to work through parts of my trauma. But for most people, they don't have outlets or places to reflect on these conditions that without awareness, they perpetuate with their kids or with their coworkers or to themselves. And so for me, the projects then, that's why the conceptual part of the methodology became so significant because it's really in those curricula that then we can get into these conditions and transform them. And then, like I said, then the art becomes the illumination of this is what we're finding. Here's the wisdom. Here's the insight 
that at least for myself and the people who've been involved is super powerful. And interestingly enough, it does resonate in a different way than just to paint them without that relationship. And how did you get to do the illustration book with Tigna? Well, and yeah, so that's kind of part of that piece. So, you know, I have to say, like, my parents were really just middle class Americans. Like, they were Catholic, not Republican, but not radical. I didn't grow up going to protests or having that kind of exposure. But they did do some stuff that was different. So, like, they would try different things. So, I can remember when I was five, they tried meditation. They did transcendental meditation. It was fashionable. And so, I did it too. And I can always remember parts of my relationship to Christianity, like the Eucharist or these different things. For me, that was like this meditative, powerful state. And even as a scientist or a kid who liked fishing and nature, like remembering that feeling so that eventually... As I got to be an adult, those things still were interesting to me. And then eventually in New York, you know, I started studying yoga because a girl that I was dating was into yoga. I'll do it. <laughs> That'll do it. And eventually I married her. So, you know, it didn't go away. But it was years of that exposure that eventually attracted me to see Thich Nhat Hanh in New York. And then uh, they had one of the first people of color retreats ever. Thich Nhat Hanh had in 2003 in California. And so I had not moved here yet, but my wife and I, like, we weren't married then. We were like, we should go. It was just a really significant experience. And because it was the first POC retreat that way in North America, just all these ballers from all over were there. And so not long after that, he went back to Vietnam for the first time in 39 years. And my wife and I went with him as part of the international delegation. And we were the only young people there because who can take off a month to just travel? You know, many of the people were there as a legacy from his work around Vietnam. But we were the only young people there, really the only people of color. You know, I had like locks down to my butt and she was six months pregnant. So like we totally stood out and it totally endeared us to that community and started a relationship that I did projects at the monasteries. So the monastery knew my work, knew my practice and so before the coloring book thing was even a thing, they were thinking about what's a way that we can do something together. And at that time, I was already doing these big coloring projects where people would color. Well, I would scaffold populations to do these colorings. And so a lot of the pictures in the book are actually the project from Nigeria or the project from these places reinvented as ways for people to get into them. So it kind of really came out of that personal relationship to Thich Nhat Hanh and to the community that that was made. That's amazing. I can't even imagine seeing you guys at that time with your wife pregnant and you guys just being down to roll. I could totally see it. Like you guys and a bunch of like retire old activists. That's totally what it was. (laughs) That's totally what it was. Yeah, that could take that time. It would be down to roll. I love it. I love it. (laughs) And so many like indirect lessons from that because we're the only people of color there. There's all these other experiences. And then I would also say, to the point of process, really part of why I would go on retreats is like, yeah, I'd go there and meditate. And I'd be like, how are they doing this? How do you travel with 100 people? How do you set up? I was totally studying like the methodologies around reflection and engagement and scaffolding and some of these things that have been part of my practice that have been informed by literally being with them and watch them do it. Well, if you ever take a group, I'm down. Sign me up. (laughs) (laughs) If you're ever thinking about Setting up your own tours, right? You know, you can count me in. (laughs) I definitely would. (laughs) Okay. So aside from you're a professor, you know, you've been teaching for years. Also, you do other administrative stuff in the art world. Where do you kind of see your role now in the art world, aside from just being a creator? Because I feel like so much of your work also is on where the future of it could go. Well, yeah. I mean, in the spirit of that, I had a friend, she's an ED at an interesting art organization, and we were talking one night and she said, at some point, if you're really interested in institutional change, you're going to become an administrator. And so literally, you know, I'm talking about social change in all these different forms. And so on the one hand, I'm really skeptical of institutional change. I'm not a big believer in, you know, it's social 101, like institutions resist change. So on the one hand, I'm not expecting we can't even get rid of the electoral college. Like, you know, there are a lot of things <laughs> yeah. that we can all say is bad and you just can't change them. And at the same time, institutions are made of individuals. And to the degree that individuals change or the degree that institutions change. 
So I think more and more of my work now has involved being this reference as people in institutions grapple with how can we change? How can we be in community? Because we are coming from a history that has built these institutions to not be in relation to the communities that they're in, just the community that they serve. And so as more and more institutions are approaching these inquiries, I think my expertise and shared interest has made for more partnerships. And so like, for example, now being at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, you know, as a senior fellow with the great choreographer, professor, person, human, Liz Lerman, you know, it's like we're really transforming the place. And because of our shared histories and relationship to the director, it's given us an entree with credibility to really manipulate the whole institution. The staff can't go to all the board meetings. We're at all the board meetings. We're sitting down with staff weekly. You know, we have all these different iterations of relationship through the strata of that place explicitly with the agenda to transform it. We started just before COVID, but with COVID has totally accelerated and in some ways given us more leverage. So now that's our work. You know, we're thinking about processes and workshops. And as the institution starts to reopen, we're literally working throughout the staff as well as the audiences outside of the white cube to reinvent the ways that they're in relation. And so for us, a lot of that's meant like, just be better with artists. Like, how do you, let's really start with like most institutions don't treat artists well or don't advocate for them well, or don't have healthy relationships or their actions don't align with their intentions. They're like, yeah, we want to support artists, but we're not going to give you no money. We're going to want you to do this thing for free. And then when our programming window is over, we're never going to talk to you again, (laughs) which is like, how is that? aligned with building a healthy community or relationship. It's exploitive. It's like a fling, you know, it's like you can't say that you're in a long-term relationship when you're really just having a fling. (laughs) And it's not with benefits. It's not even a fling. (laughs) It's like a service oftentimes. And because of the unfortunate role that art has played in our society, it's not validated, particularly financially, you know, so there are all these unsaid expectations that are, exploitive and, in my opinion, reinforce these hierarchies that have been increasingly what I'm trying to deconstruct and flatten, you know, about where art matters and who matters because of what they make and where should it be seen. So increasingly being in these roles for me is really powerful. It is radically different than the Western notion of what art should be. It is different than like, yeah, this is my piece on the wall. I'm going to sign it and you all are going to know I did it and I'm going to put it on Instagram and even more people are no. Like no one knows what we're talking about at the board. That's not Instagrammable. (laughs) Yeah, it's not. And it's so powerful, you know, to think that there are 30 artists who are being scaffolded financially, institutionally, in social networks, in part because Liz and I have been the catalyst for that is just so radical because they're still making work. There's still 30 more super high powered, creative people generating representation, generating relationships, all this stuff, but they're being nurtured in part because of our advocacy. And so for me, it's more anonymous, but it's also in some ways just more another way to be transformative. Absolutely. Well, Brett, you know, honestly, I can talk to you all day and I really wish sometimes I'm like, I wish these could go on for like hours and, you know, we could bring some brownies in, all that fun stuff. But, you know, I want to respect your time. What are you working on right now and how do people find you? I have a new website coming soon. So brett-cook.com. It's not out yet, but it's coming. Facebook, Instagram, Brett Cook Studio. Really, yeah, the Yerba Buena project is really amazing. I mean, I think in uh, I think it's the first week of August we're going to start doing some things more specifically with the staff that are a little bit more public. And then I'd say probably in a year there'll be some giant thing that features Liz and I per se. But I also think that a lot more of the things I'm doing, yeah, are really scaffolds to other people's success to the degree that they're seen or not seen. As long as they support other people in that work, I feel successful. Yeah, absolutely. Brett, I feel like I know that 
your influence has had such a catalytic impact on me as an individual and as me as a creative. So I can't even imagine how this is also going to affect so many other artists along the way. I feel like a whole other part of your resume could be like mentor. And then you could have like the list of all of us that have like come under your wings that you've like sheltered and scolded and molded and checked along the way in such a powerful way. I feel like you always drop the gems. That's why I call you the Oracle. Every time I come to see you, you tell me the things I need and then you push me out the door and I'm ready to go. <laughs> and so forever, always thankful for you as yourself, as the creative that you are and really what you do for us that come behind you. So thank you so much. I'm just so touched by that. Such a great compliment. So honored to be associated with you in any way that I am. <laughs> I always love speaking with you. Thank you so much, Brett, for being here with us today. Always a pleasure. And y'all check out Brett Cook, follow him on Instagram, on socials, check out his new website when it drops and look for something big at Yerba Buena. Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. Please be sure to like this episode, write a review and share with your friends on social. And if you haven't already done so, please press the subscribe button and follow us on Instagram at Not Real Art World.